The 88-meter Maltese Falcon was built for an American venture capitalist by Perini Navi. And when it was launched, it was the largest private sailing yacht in the world. But more importantly, it incorporated some extraordinary design features, including the diner rig from Jerry Dykstra. But the exterior styling of this vessel and the amazing interior of the vessel were done by Ken Frivok, who is the subject of our podcast today. Hello and welcome to the Yacht Channel's first podcast, where I'm very pleased to tell you that we're going to be chatting today with one of the top super yacht designers in the world, Ken Frivok. He'll be speaking to us from his studio in the River Hamble in the south coast of England. By way of background, I first met Ken over 20 years ago uh, when I was managing the Sunseeker dealership in Mexico for Camper Nicholson's, and Ken was the interior designer for all of the Sunseekers. Uh, which were incredibly popular and still are. But he's gone on to bigger and better things, as we'll get into today. So in reading about Ken to prepare for our chat today, I learned for the first time that he was raised in Los Angeles. And he studied uh, architecture and engineering in Peru prior to moving to the UK, where he attended the Royal College of Art and picked up a master's in design degree. So now let's zoom in to Ken's studio in the River Hamble and start the conversation. Hello, Ken, and welcome to the Yacht Channel. I did an intro, um, and I mentioned some of your background. Maybe we could uh, start with that, because I didn't realize that you grew up in Los Angeles. Yeah, I was born there, and I, I was there until about seven years old. But then you studied in Peru, it said. Uh, that is correct, yes. I initially studied architecture there. And uh, then I got uh, a scholarship, a Duke of Edinburgh scholarship, to come over to England uh, to the Royal, Royal College of Art, which is a premier postgrad um, school in Europe. Um, and again, initially, I was more involved with buildings, but I quickly uh, became more interested and explored the possibility of, of joining the industrial design school uh, as they had all the all the amazing machinery lathes and more technical you know i was always uh, more attracted uh, to the more technical parts of uh, of design which eventually was what drifted me over to had to be involved with yachts. Well, just uh, as, a, as a side note i went to the national film school out in beaconsfield Right. And due to the British government, we had phenomenal facilities. I was very lucky uh, as a foreigner to... No, to... it's a shame that sometimes the, the local students don't appreciate quite how ma- amazing the facilities are. It was quite difficult to get into the Royal College, but once you're in, it's almost as if the the people that allowed you in will not admit they maybe make, made a mistake. So uh, <laughs> some of the students are, are quite dedicated and some are quite relaxed. How did you transition into yachts? Well, I was working as an architect and industrial designer, but I was doing some sailing and moved up to a quarter town racing yacht, uh, which I agreed to buy on the proviso that I could uh, modify it. Uh, And once that was done, uh, everybody after me wanted my version of of that uh, model. So the company asked me to design the rest of the range. And uh, then that was seen by other companies. I think it was Fairline. um, And they asked me to design their motorboats. Uh, and then I was headhunted by Sunseeker International, um, and I was the exclusive designer for them for about 13 years. I think that's when I uh, first met you. I was uh, I ran the Sunseeker dealership in Mexico a long time ago, and when Hans Wahlberg was there, and uh, um, you and I believe Don Shedd did the hulls, and you did the interiors. That's correct. It's interesting. It was when I started, which was quite some time ago. Say there were very few um, even drawing boards. So it's uh, it's quite amazing how the progression went there. And in terms of current projects, we have uh, a couple of really interesting ones. We have uh, 
a 74 meter that is nearing completion in, in Turkey at uh, Turquoise. And that is for a South American customer. Very, very interesting. Quite unusual features. Some of them relate to, to his interests. He has a, a vineyard as well. And so we had to uh, develop a, a wine cellar, for example, on, on the as, as an integral part of, of the Upper Deck Saloon. Uh, which is an interesting challenge. And another project that's progressing uh, was one that was started no less than uh, 12 years ago now. Um, we started, we did the design of an 88 meter motor yacht and the owner uh, decided that perhaps uh, it would be a very competitive option to try and get it built in South America. So the project started there. It was an American shipyard based in, in the north of Chile. It was Marco Chilena in the sort of north of Chile, pretty much in the desert. Uh, it never rains there at all. Ken, I've been there. <laughs> if they have a hole in the roof, they don't fix it because it doesn't matter. No, exactly. There is no, no concern, certainly, about the weather. And interestingly enough, the, the level of workmanship in terms of actually working with the steel plates and aluminium is, uh, is very good because you know, their background was, was tuna boats, if you want to describe, you know, big fishing boats, which don't get fair. So they, they actually have to get the shape of the plates good enough that without using fillers and paste and so on, it still has to be acceptable. There were beautiful hulls. There were 80 meter saners. He was doing a, a sea trial when I happened to be there and uh, we went out into those big uh, Pacific rollers and uh, the sea keeping was fantastic. In fact, the hull that was uh, used for the 88 meter was one, you know, a development of one of their hulls with hopefully the same very good sea keeping. I think that the Chileans ran into trouble or Marco Chilena. And mm -hmm. so the, the hull was uh, towed and at the moment it's proceeding full steam ahead. So it's with Golden Yachts in, uh, in Athens. Yeah, that's correct. Can we talk a little bit about Maltese Falcon? Because that's um, such an interesting breakthrough project. Um, was that, was that the first one that you did for Mr. Perkins? No, not at all. We uh, met Tom. He approached us when he, he was, as you probably know, he was a very, very keen uh, sailing racer, mm -hmm. uh, yacht race, racing. And he decided he needed a, what he called a tender. Uh, to attend the races and use as a base. So he approached us quite out of the blue. He just, you know, I suddenly got a, a phone call from this uh, strange American just, uh, just saying, you know, he has seen my work. He, he liked what he saw. Uh, would I be available to see him? I said, yes, I think so, of course. Um, and he said, all right, I'll be there in 45 minutes. And uh, he appeared on his McLaren F1. And uh, the moment I saw the car, I thought, well, this is serious. So he came, he arrived at your door. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely so. And uh, it started a very amazing relationship because obviously we did that. That tender was the yacht Atlantide. We found uh, one of the Dunkirk little ships uh, that that was lying in Malta, and we pretty much chainsawed the the, the top of it and restyled the new interior, all in Art Deco, 100% Art Deco. He was very pleased with that. It was launched. It was uh, finished in England at Camper Nicholson. And um, not long after we finished that, he rang and he says, you know, are you up to another project? And, and he, he said, I want, you know, a big sailboat. Uh, he had Mariette at the time. He had been using Andromeda Ladea, which is a pretty navy, um, when he wasn't racing. And then Mariette and Atlantide when he was racing. But he wanted to do a bit more world cruising. 
and uh, and he wanted to innovate. I mean, he was a risk taker, you know, uh, venture capitalist. Um, he wanted to try some new ideas, and he wanted, I guess, he wanted, an, you know, what he, I guess he considered to be an imaginative uh, designer that could understand that he just didn't want a run of the mill project. And um, we, he had heard, and uh, I had also seen that there was a howl uh, at the Perini Navy base in Tuzla and, and Turkey, um, which had been started quite a few years before and ground to a halt. We went to see it, and there was a little bit of repeat of what happened with uh, Atlantide and that he turned to me and said, can we keep some of that superstructure? And I said, not really. I think we need the chainsaw again. Uh, but certainly we can keep the, the, you know, really elegant, a little bit uh, fine. It wasn't very beamy. So we all, always knew it was going to be a little bit tender, but probably very efficient. And uh, so he agreed with Perini Navi uh, to purchase that hull, which would then also give us a sort of advantage of a year, year and a half and, uh, in terms of the speed of the build. Uh, and then it was a question of, of discussing what can we do that's, uh, that's rather special and different. Uh, you know, are we stuck with the normal sort of sale arrangements? and uh, Jerry Dykstra had offered, you know, two or three different sale options, um, and one of them was the the Dyna rig, which mm. was the, the rig that was eventually adopted. But yeah, it was it was an incredible relationship because you know what we did, we couldn't have done uh, with you know in quotes a normal uh, or less adventurous uh, owner. And uh, the relationship with the rest of the team was also quite special. So obviously it ended up uh, being quite a groundbreaking project. The uh, things that you did with carbon fiber, as far as I know, nobody else had ever gone to uh, that extent. Exactly. I mean, we took that right through. So as, as you went into the, the yard, you know, we used quite a bit of carbon fiber internally and, you know, at the bridge and in some key areas. Uh, in the atrium, you know, we were very um, anxious to express, if you want, the structure and express what, you know, what the yacht was about and the mast. So, you know, that view you just had behind you where it looks at the atrium. Uh, actually, that's another view that you, I see behind you, which is the dining room. And that is a, that is a very good typical example of um a different way to look at something because that was a skylight on top of the, the dining table and mm -hmm. you, you would normally just have a round skylight and then some sort of a blind that goes from side to side and instead i proposed to tom i said why don't we do it the same as uh, as a camera you know have a, an iris uh the, sh the shutter of a camera and make it open and close uh, automatically that way, uh, which is what exactly we did uh, on, on that particular feature. Uh, but moving to this multi-level atrium, uh, I was very anxious to be able to see that, yeah, exactly, see the mass right through all the levels, um, and also achieve some sort of vertical integration between the various decks. So it didn't feel as if to go from deck A to deck B, you had to go through a corridor to a little staircase and go up, and then you were on the next deck up. You know, here you were traveling through this amazing uh, space, you know, that and contained the mast, that contained the spiral staircase that surrounded the, the mast and you just felt you know in a single huge uh, space um, and that applied to almost the whole philosophy of how that interior worked instead of having doors we in most cases had moving walls between something like the dining room you know in fact the view you're showing right now was uh, 
uh, one great big challenge for a team from Germany um, because I wanted those sliding doors, what we sometimes call the patio doors at the back of the yacht. Um, I wanted them to completely disappear at the touch of a button. Uh, we had designed an inside out bar, uh, half of it open to inside, half out. But when the doors disappeared, which is what I was trying to achieve, uh, you just weren't aware of what's outside and what's inside. So it was one big continuum, one huge uh, space, you know, with very few uh, restrictions, if you want. Tom had a collection of art uh, in Plumpton in his house in Moated House in England. And so I went there with him. We chose what, what paintings, you know, he would like to have on the yacht. And we actually designed a number of the spaces to suit, specifically to suit the paintings. And in some cases, we took some liberties, like the painting that you can see there. We actually uh, worked on the frame of it and, and curved it so it actually would fit the slightly curved uh, surface uh, facing the, the atrium. Then out of this, um, presumably Black Pearl? Yeah, a, it, it, it is strange it took so long. You know, I thought once uh, Montez Falcon was launched and it even won races and proved that it, it could go across the oceans, it proved that it could be almost handled single-handed painting uh, that uh, a number of other owners would maybe jump on the bandwagon but there were some inquiries but typically the reaction was well i don't want to copy tom perkins and you know my reaction was well you're copying everybody else you know uh, why do, why not do a development of uh, of that concept and eventually the black pearl came um you know the owner called me and and we did about uh, two years of work together um to develop the concept of that uh you know using the same um or very similar sort of rig um and eventually we prepared the tender documentation and, and um, Ocean Coast sort of got the, the contract to build that. That yacht is out there doing very well, very, uh, very efficient. Um, and um, I think the shipyards, you know, the likes of Perini Navi, for example, and a couple of the other shipyards, they're all very keen to uh, embark on projects using the, the Dyna rig or what's called the Falcon rig now. Um, and uh, I'm sure we will see more of it. Yeah, you would think so, with um, everybody more concerned about the environment and. Almost nothing more, uh, you know, greener, if you want, than sailing, because you, you can. You know, you can have green technology, but if you don't have to even turn an engine to, to leave your mooring and you can go across the Atlantic uh, using just the, the wind, then surely is uh, a very, you know, a very promising <laughs> way to do it with minimum uh, carbon footprint and, and, you know, very much on the green side. Do these boats generate electricity while they're under sail? Do they have, like? Yes. Well, certainly the the um, with in Black Pearl we did study a number of ops. If you want the props that rotate um, and effectively do uh, generate some electricity at the expense of maybe a, a knot in speed or you know a very slight drop in and and speed because of the extra resistance. Related technologies, I mean, we're talking about uh, sails that would have a, a layer, if you want, a photovoltaic uh, film attached to the sails, so, so they would also generate electricity as, a, as a sort of giant uh, solar panels. One part of the work uh, we do, which extends beyond just design, is everything when we were working on the falcon everything had to be revolutionary and different and and cost so tom wanted to have two 10 meter tenders 
I designed them and I found an outfit, you know, a builder that I that I knew but three quarters of the way along the process, uh, the builder was going bankrupt and we ended up or I ended up purchasing the assets of that company uh, because I could see that there's a, you know, a gap in the market for, for more adventurous tenders, you know, more elegant, better fitted out, more keeping with, uh, with the amazing superiors that people were starting to build. Um, and so we started Pasco International. That's now been going about 12 years. Um, I have about 90 people on board. And I, I guess it's the premier super yacht tender builder at the moment in, in the world. So w- where are they? Uh, that's at the Hamble River in England. Oh, it is. So right where you are. Exactly. So I could be designing something, send the drawing across. Uh, the courtyard uh, to Pasco, and probably two two hours later, some one of the workmen will come back and tell me it doesn't work. Yeah. We've had some other images there. We've obviously tried, you know, different uh, breakthroughs. If you want, some of them have happened and some haven't. Um, I guess naval architects and shipyards are very set on having almost a post and beam solution to the structures, a bit like uh, they used to build houses and or they still build houses. I've been interested to develop a structure that is much more monolithic, you know, torsionally more resistant um, and to provide greater spans and, and and more interest to the inside. So you have that. And the other thing is to use uh, glass in greater quantities, you know, glass can be, uh, they can achieve amazing things with glass now. It can be structurally as strong and not stronger than the, than the steel plate. And, uh, and obviously it gives you panoramic views and creates a very, yeah, exactly. So there you have the, uh, the equivalent of a virendal beam, uh, which is that zigzag uh, thing with the, sections of the beam that aren't so that are inert part of it sort of not taken out if you want and that's what's giving you the transparency but you still have the strength and the rigidity panes of glass can also be generating electricity yeah again uh, that is new technology that is some of it is available now and some of it we know is is going to become available. So we've made provision. <laughs> what trends do you see in the industry right now? Where do you think things are going? Interesting that um, there's more of an, an awareness, if you want, that they that you don't have to have a yacht that looks the same as, uh, as what was built the year before or whatever. So a number of owners um, tend to be more open, you know, to new shapes. So, uh, you know, if, if uh, design details like plumbers or reverse bows, you know, uh, uh, yachts that can transform, open up much more to the ocean. So when you're in a safe anchorage, uh, you can open a beach club with shell doors that open as balconies. Um, you know, you can drive the tender into a, in, in an internal um, swimming pool, for example, so you could have a salt swimming pool and a, and a sweet water swimming pool uh, on board. Um, I think I think the possibilities are great. The, the yachts have been getting bigger and bigger. I think, in my opinion, some of them are just almost too big. So I think some of the owners that maybe were building um, 120, 140 meter super yachts are now looking at projects where they maybe have an 80 meter or 70 meter uh, super yacht, which will do almost everything the other, the bigger yacht was able to do. Uh, but in parallel, have an explorer or support vessel, uh, which they can then use alongside. It uh, can go ahead, it can carry the toys, it can carry some of the super for numeraries and support staff. And what would what advice would you give to young people that uh, would like to become yacht designers? 
Well, I think to their imagination fly and and try different things because if if some of them are worthwhile, it'll open some doors to maybe the more adventurous and interesting owners. Um, so, you know, a they will get the work, and b they will be working with the more interesting people um, that could take their careers uh, further. In the age of COVID, um, are, are you're keeping busy, obviously, and you've got a lot of projects that are ongoing. Um, how, how do you think this is going to affect the industry overall? Is it going to slow us down beyond temporarily? Uh, no, I think only at a temporary level. Obviously, we have experienced certain issues with the supply chain, like, uh, you know, on the tenders, for example, some of the engines are made by Volvo. Volvo, was, you know, is closed until September, um, you know, because more on the automotive side, but that happens to be the engines that are also used for some of the boats. Uh, some of the windscreens uh, came from Italy. Italy for a period was closed, so that delayed the, some uh, supplies. Uh, fenders came from Holland. You know, it's a multinational industry, so this, the supply chain uh, so was certainly affected. But in terms of uh, future projects and future work, I just don't see an impact other than at the level of the middle ground. Um, leisure boats. So the, the owners of super yachts, uh, they never seem to be that affected, uh, or certainly not to the extent that it stops their projects. All right. Well, thank you, Ken, for uh, taking the time and sharing your thoughts. And uh, we'll be talking with you again in the future, I hope, uh, checking in on new projects that you're up to. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's nice to, to discuss them and to try and uh, see other people's point of view and, and how they imagine the, the industry is moving. But certainly there's a lot of interest and it's a great, great industry and a great combination of, of aesthetics with, you know, utility and purpose. So uh, certainly I enjoy it and I hope some of the owners working with us will do too. Thank you very much, Paul. All right. And I'm, I'm going to put a link down at the bottom uh, to your website, which is fantastic. You get so much information on there. And uh, hopefully that'll, it'll start some conversations. Thank you. Appreciate it. That concludes our podcast for today. And there are some links here for uh, connections, as I mentioned, and also to subscribe to the podcast. Upcoming, we have some very interesting chats that we're going to have uh, one with a captain who's here in Newport for the season chartering. We are also talking to a former captain who is now a port agent who will have, uh, I hope, some good insights into what we can expect in the Caribbean for cruising this next season. And we have um, some other really interesting uh, naval architects and designers that have signed up. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next podcast.